We Are Market Basket is the extraordinary true story of an ousted CEO and the fight back from his employees to bring him back. Daniel Corshawn is the co-author of the book alongside Grant Welker, and I'm delighted that Daniel joins me on the line to talk to us about this amazing story. Daniel, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to have you here. It's great to talk to you as well, because this is, uh, quite honestly, an extraordinary story. Uh, First of all, uh, where did you hear about this story and how did you get to writing We Are Market? Yeah, well, I had lived uh, for a number of years in the area, and so I knew about this company, Market Basket. Uh, but uh, I was already I had moved to Philadelphia, where I'm a, a business school professor. Uh, when I started to hear about this crisis that was facing the company, and it was really at first through the news, and then I started following along and visiting this uh, and taking part. Well, really watching some of these rallies as they were going on. Mm. Uh, let's set up this the, this uh, extraordinary story first of all. Market Basket and its uh, CEO at the time, uh, Arthur T. Demolas. Um, Demolas. Yeah. Demolas. Yeah. Um, who is he, and and what I suppose what did people love about him? Yeah, he is the grandson of the founder of the company. The company is called Market Basket. Uh, that's a chain of stores. It's one of the largest in New England. They have stores um, close to eighty stores by now in uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine, so up in the, in the Northeast in the United States. Uh, it's a very successful company, one of the only companies that's growing and re- still opening stores in the region. Uh, and he is the grandson of the founder. His cousin, whose name is Arthur S., so this is a story really that begins with a feud between two cousins, Arthur T., who is the CEO, and Arthur S. de Moulas, who is the majority shareholder at the time. Um, the, his cousin Arthur S uh, had a uh, gained a, a majority of shares in the company, and when uh, he and his side of the family was able to do that, they revamped the board of directors. The board of directors fired Arthur T, who was the, the beloved CEO, uh, and that's where the crisis began. And what were the, the reasons given for firing him in the first place? Yeah, he they he had had a long-standing feud with the other side of the family. So a lot of it comes down to a, a long-standing family feud. Uh, some of the board members, particularly the new ones that came on board after it was revamped, said that he was combative, uh, and uh, they questioned some of the deals that he was making. He was one of the criticisms was that he was giving too much uh, uh, to customers and employees uh, because he was very generous with the profit-sharing program. Uh, he was very generous with some customer discounts, and that really rubbed the, some of the uh, shareholders the wrong way. And uh, so, so, this is someone who who he really he built up relationships over uh, m- multiple decades uh, through his career, and uh, by really by sharing the the benefits of the business with all these other stakeholders, consu- consumers that were shopping there, uh, employees. And uh, so over the years, all these people developed this tremendous loyalty towards this store, but also uh, towards Arthur T. himself. And that's uh, pretty key because we'll see going uh, later on in the story how uh, those uh, relationships came into play as well. Uh, so where does the, I suppose, the, the movement to bring him back begin? He gets ousted. He's out of the company. Do people realize that this means everything perhaps is going to change for them or is this a, a slow kind of burn that happens over time? Yeah, it, I mean, though the entire uh, thing happened over about the course of a year and a half. Most it didn't really hit the news in a big way uh, um, until the summer of 2014, uh, and there were uh, there were about six weeks of real crisis where the company looked like it was going to completely go under, um, go bankrupt, and and close. Um, but there was a, a full year of jostling, mostly behind the scenes, but a lot of the employees at the company, they call themselves associates. Those associates were lobbying uh, with uh, the board of directors with a, an email campaign. They were sending letters. They were uh, going to the, the, the board meetings and protesting outside because they, they thought something might happen. And then in the, uh, in the late spring of 2014, Arthur T. was finally fired by the board. Uh, And that's really when the the whole thing became a a major crisis. Um, So shortly after he was fired, uh, about a few weeks after, uh, there was a major walkout. All of the distribution centers, so the the warehouses that send products to the stores, almost all of those uh, employees walked out. So these are uh, uh, factory, not factory, but uh, warehouse workers uh, who just said, we don't want to work for anyone but Arthur T., Um, 
and uh, and then uh, the rest of the company they rallied behind those workers uh, and uh, and started to to slow down the company uh, then the the really amazing part for me is the way that this spilled over to the customers because customers uh, were invited partially and partially just on their own they said we're going to support these associates that we've been working with and and seeing at these stores Mm. for these decades of shopping, uh, we're going to boycott. So they boycotted, the the sales went down almost overnight uh, by 95%. Mm. The stores were losing $10 million a day. Jesus. Um, so it's an enormous, uh, you know, two million person boycott that was going on. Uh, and then if, uh, it, if that wasn't incredible enough, uh, many of the vendors, their suppliers stepped in. And people with, we interviewed in the book one person who uh, sells seafood to the company. Uh, he has a $30 million account with Market Basket, with the supermarket chain. Uh, and he said, that's it, we're out. We're not going to sell to them anymore until Arthur T is back. So just incredible moves, you know, people making uh, great personal sacrifices uh, to get this one person back and to restore this company. And is it simply, I suppose, for want of a better way of putting it, the, the cult of the leader? Or was it the the new people, the new regime, Arthur S. Demolas, that they were all heavy handed and they came in and they changed everything and changed the way people did things and changed the prices for the customers and so on? Or was it simply that people loved Arthur T. so much they just didn't want to listen to anything or anybody? Some of it was, was just a love for Arthur T. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, there's a a store director, so he's the, the head manager at one of the Market Basket stores. His daughter was involved in an accident where she had a very serious head injury, um, and it, they, it was really in danger. I mean, she, it didn't look like she was going to make it. Um, he was at the hospital. He was worried, you know, about missing work. I mean, he was obviously most worried about his, his daughter, um, and he was beside himself, of course. But he gets a call from Arthur T., uh, who is really several levels in the organization above him. You know, I mean, the store director who reports to someone else reports to someone else mm. who reports to Arthur T. Um, but he gets a call from Arthur T., and Arthur T. asks about his daughter. How is she doing? Uh, he, and at one point he says, well, is that hospital able to handle her injuries? And he says, I think they can, uh, but, I'm, you know, I'm not 100% sure. And uh, according to Terry McCarthy, uh, Arthur T.'s next question was, do we, do we need to move her? To another hospital and and for that you know terry mccarthy said you know this company this man uh really you know i'm i'm in you know one of the the low points in my life this will probably be one of the most stressful toughest times i'll ever have to go through and he's right there with me uh and that's those are the kind of stories that people tell all the time uh, at this company, it really is quite amazing. I mean, when I came in, and you know, I I, I didn't know anyone at the company before uh, getting involved and starting to follow this, but I just started hearing story after story like this. Um, some of it from uh, times when Arthur T himself stepped in, but um, that kind of way of managing spills over a lot to to the other executives and also um, other other associates in the store. So they've really developed this very tight bond. So. Um, so getting back to what you were bringing up before, they, what was going on is that um, Arthur T. became a sort of symbol of how this company works. And people did not want to lose that. They didn't want to lose him, and they didn't want to lose the way that this company worked, this, com- this culture that had developed over many decades. And what about uh, Arthur S., his, his cousin as well? Is he simply the, the villain of the piece? I mean, how, how, does, how do things work out for him in the end as well? Yeah, I'll tell you, it's the... Um, it, in the media, it became a story. The shorthand was uh, the good Arthur and the bad mm-hmm. Arthur. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to tell because Arthur Arthur S has been has shied away from the media. Um, there, there really, as far as I know, there are no interviews of him whatsoever. Uh, he was cornered once in the elevator at one point during this crisis uh, by a reporter, but that's pretty much the the extent of our knowledge about what what really makes him tick. Um, so as outsiders, we don't know very much. Um, in in the end, though, the the way that this this crisis wrapped up um, was that the 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 board of directors that Arthur S had uh, had, had placed uh, they had a five to two majority on the board. Um, they were eventually forced to sell um, half of the company, giving Arthur T full control uh, for 1.6 billion dollars. Uh, and uh, and most of that goes to Arthur 
Arthur S. and uh, and then the rest goes to Arthur S.'s side of the family. So uh, financially, they made out very well. Um, they absolutely did not want to sell to the Arthur T. side. Um, so they wanted to sell to anyone but him just because of the longstanding family. But, but the damage was done, really, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 and um, they they uh, so they were they were forced to play a, a hand in a way that they they absolutely did not want to, uh, but they did benefit financially from it. More from Daniel after the break. You're listening to the Small Business Show on GoHustle.co. Hustle, startup stories from anywhere. back to the small business show we have uh, daniel Corshon on the line uh, from the united states and he's talking to us about uh, his book we are market basket the extraordinary story of an ousted ceo and the fight back from his employees to get him back into the company and it's all well and good to to get i suppose the, the hero of the piece arthur t back into the uh into the stores but as he said they were losing significant amounts of money and he still needed to to turn the company back around uh, when uh, when he took over again, so how did he do that? Yeah, they, I mean, it, it was a really a heroic effort from all everything that I could see. Uh, people, you know, when they made the announcement that they had reached an agreement on selling the company, the rest of the company, to Arthur T, so that his side of the family would have full control. Uh, people were, um, they were literally, they were at the doors at 11.59 at night, okay, one minute before midnight, waiting for it to become the next day so they could feel comfortable going in and starting going back to work again. <laughs> uh, so this was a group of people, that, and uh, and there were many people that literally, they, they showed up at, uh, at midnight at 1, 2 in the morning, and they worked all night. They knew that they, you know, they had to really move fast to get uh, the, the company up and running. Um, and customers as well. It was really, uh, there was funny uh, post that someone put on the, one of the Facebook pages. The social media was a big component of mm. this because they used it to bring people together. Um, they had a very uh, a, a Facebook page with uh, more than 90,000 uh, followers on it to it. Um, and uh, one person posted the next day, they said, I don't even own a pet, but if the only thing that's left in the stores is dog food, I'm going to buy it to help this company <laughs> <back> <laughs> on track. And uh, and there they were, you know, the next day they showed up and uh, they were shopping. The other ones were uh, stocking the shelves as fast as they possibly could. And um, And I'll tell you, within... Within about about two to three weeks, you would almost not know that anything would happen. It, it was really mm. quite amazing. Um, the the uh, and and the company now it's it continues to grow. Uh, it's it's still growing quickly. It's performing well. I mean, it's a tough business. Uh, the margins are are quite low in this mm. business. So there's a lot of competition, a lot of new types of competition. So bigger stores, non-traditional stores like WalMarts that are coming in. Uh, and changing the rules of the game, uh, but they're still they're holding up very well, and they're remaining competitive. Uh, one of the interesting aspects that I find about this is, I mean, we've all seen industrial disputes and and talked about them, etc. But it's very rare that you see customers get so involved in an industrial uh, relations kind of a aspect of things like this. So, what did and what have they done? to make customers come back again and again, because that kind of dedication, there must be some sort of love between the two to make, to make this love affair work. There really is. And I, I, I continue to believe that that was the key to this whole thing was the relationships between the employees, those associates and customers that had been built over time. Now, some of it was just the fact that people are just shop there uh, constantly and, and people started to recognize the faces of the people they saw. Um, some of it was really very purposeful moves by the company to make sure that those that interactions happen. Like if you go to most supermarkets, um, there are very few employees there. You hardly see anyone. In fact, if you get into trouble and can't find a product, you're you know you really have to roam around a, a long time yeah. <laughs> before you even find someone. Right? It's a very common thing. Uh, at this supermarket, one of the things that they do is they they keep a lot of employees on the floor all the time. So they stock while people are, are shopping. Now, for some people, some people find that an inconvenience because there's sometimes a cart in the way, you know, but, um, but by my count, there, you know, there are generally, you know, five times as many employees on the floor as, as most other supermarkets. There's a, you know, there's a very good chance that you can turn around and you'll see an associate right there. Uh, so people find that the associates are, are there for them, that they can, uh, you know, a- ask questions and they start to recognize people over and over as they come in. 
and uh, and that's what this company has a one of the mottos of Arthur T is that he wants to be a person serving another person. So even as other companies have made uh, big moves towards installing technology like at the checkout counter, right? Hmm. Um, you see a lot of stores that are putting in these automated uh, checkouts, and they have steered clear of that so far. Uh, and the reason they, they give is that they don't want to take away that personal contact between a, a, an employee and a, and a customer. And you can see in this case how it really paid off. There, there are some efficiencies that you can get from it uh, early on, but, uh, you know, in the moment. Uh, but when you look at the long-term effects of this, um, you really distance customers from those employees. Mm. Now, Daniel, you're at uh, Drexel University. You, you are at the LeBeau College of Business as well. So what is the... What is the business lesson here in all of this? Yeah, I think in my mind, the two really big ones. One is from a a corporate governance standpoint. Um, This was a case for me where the board of directors, which is elected by the uh, by the shareholders, uh, they, you know, there's uh, the common wisdom is that they have that they're responsible only for the interests of the shareholders. But if you look legally, and in this case, you can see it becomes very evident that they're really um, their responsibility is really towards the uh, the, the corporation as a whole, um, and so they need to they need to be a, a bit of a, a go between between the shareholders and all of these other stakeholders. In this case, they really sided. Um, with with the share a small group of shareholders only, and they were ignoring all of the uh, all of these other stakeholders. All the I mean, two million customers, twenty five thousand associates, uh, all these you know dozens and dozens of vendors. Hmm. Um, so it's a it's a call for me, uh, in, in my mind, for uh, for boards to think about a broader responsibility um, rather than just making sure that a CEO you know stays on track. Um, the other big lesson I think, which is related to that, is that. Um, consumers, employees have a lot more power than they think they have. And uh, in many cases, when there's an institution that's working well, there really is, there are opportunities um, to make sure that the needs of those groups are are, are met and that uh, by joining together, uh, they really can shape where corporations are going. Mm. Uh, Daniel, if people want to, of course, buy the book and read it for themselves, this absolutely extraordinary story and a wonderful story it is as well. Uh, where can they get it? Uh, it's uh, available through all the, the uh, traditional the sellers, uh, indie books, as well as uh, Amazon. They'll find it and in, uh, in bookstores. Absolutely, yeah. And the name of the book is We Are Market, The Extraordinary yeah. Story yeah. of... We Are Market uh, Basket, that's right. We Are Market yeah. Basket, excuse me. Yeah, uh, right. We Are Market Basket is uh, the name of the book and it uh, tells the extraordinary tale uh, of Arthur T. Demolus and uh, Market Basket, the, the shopping uh, chain in the United States. Daniel Corshawn, author uh, of the book, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.